Welcome everybody who's joining us. Um, as you're entering the room, please take a moment and introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're coming from, and what your line of work is. And as we, um, during, the con during the conversation, if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A, um, not the chat, because I'm not able to keep track of the chat. And then we'll, if there's time at the end, I'll include those. And also when you introduce yourself, please make sure to say to everyone, not just to panelists. So those of you who have introduced yourself so far, you've just introduced yourself to us. So if you can go back and put to everyone, that would be great. Um, so again, welcome everyone who's joining us for the American Botanical Council and Sustainable Herbs Program Ethnobotany webinar series. Wanted to say a few words to begin. Um, so to, is that working? Yeah. Today's webinar is Rapid Change in Himalayan Ethnobotany. Um, and I'll introduce the speakers in a moment. Um, and the next in the Ethnobotany webinar series will be on April 8th, and that's Ethics and in Indigenous Practices. And I'll be speaking with Kelly Bannister, who has done, uh, has really led the way in rethinking the ethical implications of working on ethnobotany and in Indigenous communities around the world. And she'll be joined by another speaker that is to, still to be confirmed. And then we're also on the, the separate webinar series is the Sustainable Herbs Program Sustainability and Regenerative Practices Toolkit Series. And I'm really excited about the next two in this series, which are gonna be looking at really um, how to create healthy soils and healthy communities on, while growing botanicals for the botanical industry. Um, the first one will be with corporate owned farms and that's on March 18th. And then the second one will be uh, with smaller family owned farms and that's on April 1st. And all of that information and additional information on the topics and the speakers is on the Sustainable Herbs Program and the American Botanical Council websites. And you can register for those now. Um, and so, Oh, and so these webinars are made available for free through the generous support of the Sustainable Herbs Program underwriters. And you can see this is a range of really high quality botanical companies. Um, you can find out more information on our website and links to their websites. And the webinars are also made free through the generous memberships of the American Botanical Council. Um, and you can find out more information about becoming a member on the American Council Botanical Council website. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and introduce the speakers for today. Um, as I said, we're looking at rapid change in the Himalayas, which is an area near and dear to my heart. And so I'm especially looking forward to this conversation. And I'm joined by Jan Salik and Robbie Hart. And Jan Salak is an ethnobotanist and senior curator at the Missouri Botanical Garden, where she's worked in various capacities since 2000. She's taught botany, ethnobotany, ecology, and evolution. And her research has taken her all over the world. And that's included 15 years in the Himalayas in Tibet, Bhutan, and Nepal, studying the effects of climate change on plants and peoples. In 2019, she was awarded the David Fairchild Medal for Plant Exploration in recognition of a lifetime of service. So welcome, Jan, it's great to have you. Thank I'm you. Also joined by, we're also joined by Robbie Hart. And then Robbie Hart got his doctorate in biology. And so he approaches ethnobotany from a natural sciences perspective. Um, with a particular interest in using quantitative methods from ecology for ethnobotanical questions. For the past 12 years, he spent working in the Himalayas looking also at how climate change affects when plants bloom, where they grow, and how they are used by people. Robbie is also the, or he is the William L. Brown Curator of Economic Botany at the Missouri Botanical Garden, and he's the director of the William Brown Center. 
and he'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But anyway, welcome both, uh, both of you. I'm so glad to have you here and to have a chance to dive in a little bit to your work. Um, Jan, I wondered if you could start and just tell us a bit about how you came into ethnobotany and really this focus on climate change. Um, well, I, I joined the ranks of ethnobotanists fairly late because there was no sort of major in that when I, when I came through. So I majored in ecology and systematics, uh, but I got a postdoc um, with Ian Prance at, at the New York Botanical Garden and then later a assistant scientist position there um, as an ethnobotanist. And, and um, at that time, I wasn't even sure what that was. You know? I, I, had, I had collected uh, a lot of what, um, indigenous crops and wild crop relatives and so on. So I'd sort of worked around the edges of ethnobotany, but it wasn't until and at that time, then I went to Peru and worked with indigenous tribes in the Peruvian Amazon, upper Amazon. Uh, so that was really the beginning. But when I came to the Missouri Botanical Garden, then they were doing the flora of China. And they said, would you be interested in working in China? And I said, sure, absolutely. <laughs> and so they, the day after I joined, they shipped me off to China and uh, traveled all over, you know, looking for possible projects and everything. And um, and flying all over, I ended up flying up into the Himalayas. And I thought, no, no, I have no real qualifications in the Himalayas. I can't work here. But once you see them, you just sort of fall in love immediately. So, so it was like, oh, OK, twist my arm. I'll work in the Himalayas. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's since 2000. So it's now, um, it's now 20 years. Uh, but, uh, but it's been. You know, in retrospect, you think you've been you've been meant for this your whole life. But uh, my mother worked with indigenous uh, American Indians and and various peoples, and my father was a naturalist. So together, they made me. <laughs> That's great. I wanted to ask you a little bit more. Um, so, and what were the questions that really drew you? that you found most compelling? I mean, the Himalayas are beautiful and spectacular. But... Right. Well, as far as, I mean, I'd been aware of questions in climate change since the, you know, I was a graduate student in the 80s, 70s and 80s. So, you know, it was very, it's the scientific interest in climate change had started then. And I'd been teaching about climate change. And, and um, so I, you know, was well aware of it, but nowhere was it, quite as obvious as it was in the Himalayas. And not only obvious to me, but to, to the Tibetans themselves. And when, you know, when we would discuss problems that they had and things that they were facing, many, many aspects of climate change would come up. Their, uh, the locals vision, um, awareness of climate change was, was very keen and, and very specific. So, uh, we did quite a bit of research on that too. So that's where the climate change came in. Great, and I'll we'll dive in a little more. Um, Robbie, I'd love to hear a bit about um, the key questions you're really drawn to in ethnobotany and how you came to the work that you're doing. Sure. Um, well, I actually started out as a, uh, as a linguist. My undergraduate training is in linguistics. And um, I, I was um, born in, in the mountains, in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Um, and um, I, I first went to the Himalayas as uh, part of study abroad in this undergraduate linguistics career and really fell in love with it. And also first there started to see this um, uh, interaction between people who know deeply about local flora, local plants, and who also retain an indigenous language. So to see this connection between um, uh, cultural diversity and particularly linguistic diversity and also botanical diversity that um, I think a lot of us have seen is so dramatic uh, across the world and particularly in the Himalayas. Um, so I, I knew then I wanted to follow that up. I didn't know exactly how, but um, several years uh, I was able to 
um, started addressing these questions with uh, Jan as my, my graduate mentor, um, looking at this from the perspective of biology. So looking at how, as you said in your introduction, how climate change affects um, both alpine plants, but also the people that use them and the ways in which they're, they're able to use them. So continuing with, with that research, I'm, I'm very interested in high mountain um, plants and um, in mountain and high elevation communities around the world. Uh, and I'm also have a continuing interest in, in language and in traditional ecological knowledge as it's packaged in language and in other, in other ways. Um, and, and in looking in quantitative ways as well as qualitative ways as at how that's communicated, how it's transmitted and um, how we can you know, try to assist with the continuance of both plant species and traditional knowledge. I love the link between the linguistic diversity and the botanical diversity because it's more specific than just cultural diversity and, and, and then the loss of that. But um, before getting into that also, so I'd love to hear each of you talk about, so why mountains? What is it unique about mountains and alpine plants? Well, it was, um, with climate change, there are two areas that are most rapidly affected by climate change. One is the Arctic, but there aren't that many plants in the Arctic. There are, I mean, obviously there are some, but, but, um, uh, but the second one is, is mountains and particularly the Himalayas. And there's a whole, we joined a, a whole group of mountain botanists around the world studying the effects of climate change on mountain flora um, so that we could we could take advantage of, you know, we were, we were really on the forefront in, in gaining scientific data on what climate, the effects of climate change, you know, how, how climate change affected plants as well as people. And uh, so we were looking for an area where we could, where we were hoping we could see those changes over a time period somewhat less than our lifetime. Um, it got pretty close with me, but um, so that's that was the reason for that. And mountains are great because they, um, you know, they they contain populations of plants that are under this uh, very intense climatic regimen, right? That. Uh, at least ecologists tend to think that what you see here is communities of plants that are really strongly affected by, by temperature because they're subject to these extreme temperatures, these short growing seasons. And um, as you can see on, on lots of mountains around the world, um, this elevational gradation of vegetation where which plant species are there changes across elevation. So it, it offers a, a really nice, ecological tool or study system to, to look at changes, even though they might be subtle changes. And as Jan says, also the mountains around the world, um, actually there's been evidence that, that mountains are actually experiencing more warming than other places around the world. But the Himalayas in, in particular are um, experiencing even more rapid warming. And um, I was really happy to see that Rick Silber is here in the audience because uh, there is a, uh, a piece he co-authored in New York Times recently that really sets that out, the, um, the rapid effects of climate change in the Himalaya and also just the, the, rapid, um, uh, the rapid climate change as well as its rapid effects. Well, and I'm also really glad to see Gabriel Campbell is here. And I worked with Gabriel Campbell years ago with the Makali Bruin Conservation Project. And he spent years in Nepal with Isimode and the Mountain Institute on conservation. So um, to think more, so Jan, can you talk, so the, this methodology, as I understand it, it's the, is that the Gloria methodology? Can you talk a little bit about that and for the, a lay person like me who is not? So, know. so just starting out looking at, at climate change, you know, we, we said, okay, well, what kind of basic research should we do? And, and we, did, we did a lot of ethnobotanical various kinds of ethnobotanical research, but we thought, well, we should also be looking at how 
the plants are changing. Um, and, but we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So there was this Gloria methodology and it's, and it's sort of crazy. It's real Germanic, you know, very thorough methodology and very standardized. And, and um, so, and basically what you do is you look at the, the vegetation between tree line and, you know, the highest realms of, of plant life in the mountains. And where that is in different continents is different. So the Europeans are working between 2,000 and 3,000 meters, which is quite civilized. You know, they, they, they drive up to their sites in cars and they, you know, unload their equipment. Well, for us, <laughs> it's between 4,000 and 5,000 meters and uh, there's no roads, you know? <laughs> so we're hiking in for weeks sometimes to get to some of our sites and working at extremely high elevations and camping out and so on. So it, it got to be a bit rugged, but it was, it was spectacular. And I said, you, you know, there's sort of 95% of the time you are miserable, but that 5% of the other 5%, you're just in heaven. So, uh, you know, you, you, you persevere with the methodology. But anyway, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different methods, but it's, you pick summits at these different elevations, four summits at different elevations at each site. And, um, and then you, there's a, a Brom Blanc, a, a, a kind of a general survey of uh, species and, and, and how common they are. And then there are these incredibly uh, exacting, you know, meter square plots, 32 meter square plots at each, on each mountain top that you are down there on your stomach, hands and knees and, and counting every individual plant in centimeter square, you know, subdivisions of each of those. And uh, you mark those all out. And so then you go back in a seven year period, seven years later, and you re-census everything. So uh, extremely exacting, but um, it, as I said, it's a technique that's being used around the world. And so we can make comparisons with other mountains everywhere. And that's very useful. And, and it so takes a long know. time to start to get, oh, I'm sorry, Anne. No, go ahead. It takes a long time to start to get the um, results beyond the baseline results. Of course, you know, the minimum is seven years, but, um, but then it just picks up momentum as you go. So we were really excited to um, last well, in 2019, um, be able to go and do um, our first site, do the third survey at them. So to be able to have this project that, that Jan and her collaborators started uh, 15 years ago, um, that we can then see uh, along multiple time points, how the temperatures have changed exactly, how the plant compositions have changed, and, and really get an, um, this rigorous, species specific, location specific window into how climate change is affecting the plants. And so the first, you know, when you went back for the first seven years, what did you find and was it what you expected or were you surprised and well, what was surprising and what wasn't? Yeah, no, I think there were some, some unexpected. There were some things that, that we, because we had seen what was happening in Europe, we were expecting you know, something similar. And some of it was similar, but some of it was dissimilar. So in general, um, the species diversity and, and frequency in, of plants in the Alpine is increasing tremendously because of the warmer temperatures and, and um, uh, less snowfall and so on. Um, but uh, and we found and we found plants moving up the mountain from plants that need warmth um, moving up the mountain into the alpine that hadn't been there previously at lower elevations. But the surprising thing was what we found at higher elevations, the you know five thousand meters. Um, what we found is that we got more endemic species than we had previously, and all the other mountains around the world are getting many fewer, that endemics are disappearing elsewhere. And we don't really know the cause of it, but it, it looks as though there are so many endemic species in the Himalayas. The Himalayas are famous for 
or endemics. You know, there are just so many unique species in the Himalayas um, and that they're just, they're um, uh, distributing themselves from mountaintop to mountaintop. You know, when you specialize on mountaintops, you have to find ways to, to get from one mountaintop to another, you know, it has to, you have to be dispersed. You don't go down the mountain and then up the next mountain because they just don't grow at lower elevations. So here we were finding more endemic species and, and that difference really says something about the Himalayas and how diverse uh, the plant life is in the Himalayas. Robbie, do you want to elaborate more on what um, sure. plants so, are changing and then the phenology, you know, weaving in the mm -hmm. additional, and, and as you answer, someone is that Gabriel Campbell has asked the location of the field sites, if you could weave that sure. in. Sure, so we have, um, in terms of the, our Gloria, what the Gloria program called target region, uh, we have nine of them that we coordinate in collaboration with local teams in each country. Um, and so those are spread across uh, Southwest China. So the far sort of Eastern extent of the greater Himalayan region um, was where Jan and her colleagues first set up the first sites. Um, and now they've extended through sites in um, central and Western Bhutan and sites in uh, central and Eastern Nepal. So it's a, um, 1500 or 2000 kilometer transect across the Himalaya that we're able to um, get a look at. And so then you asked about a, a couple of things, uh, phenology as well as sort of more, more elaboration on, on the changes in the plants themselves. So I just wanna be clear about what Jen said that you know, the basic idea that we're seeing more green there. Um, so more plant richness, but also more plant cover is something that, that we had expected to see, or at least hypothesized might be the case. As things get warmer, you do see more plants. Um, and what they saw in Europe was uh, that most of these plants or more and more of these plants tended to be those associated with lower elevation. So they were getting a signal of plants all moving upwards. And, um, and Jan mentioned that, you know, interestingly, we're only seeing that at our, at our lowest sites. We're not seeing it at the, at the highest elevation sites yet. Uh, but of course, even though the plants are increasing, we have more richness and more cover, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're functioning in the same way, especially in their relationships with uh, other plants with other animals or uh, sorry, other organisms like animals such as pollinators or with other organisms like people um, who rely on these plants as uh, medicinal plants and as pasture for yaks and cows. So one of the ways that they can, you know, first of all, they can just not be in the same places. So there's more of this plant, but it's not where people are coming to look for it or where a pollinator is coming to look for it. Um, Secondly, they can be coming at different times. So in my dissertation work, um, which was my first field work uh, in the Himalaya as a biologist, I was looking at how climate change can affect the flowering times of, of plants. So as you might expect, um, often in a warmer year, plants are flowering earlier, but that can change. And different species have different limitations on exactly how much they can react to climate in that way. And that means that, that just as plants might not be growing where they usually grow, they might not be growing when they usually grow. So a pollinator or a medicinal plant collector or a yak might not be encountering the same species when it happens to be in the field on the mountain. And, and so can you can say, so and what, what difference does that make? Why? Should, why does that matter? Well, there can be, you know, there can be lots of lots of impacts from this. Uh, so, you know, what what's common across a lot of uh, studies of climate change around the world that involves uh, the perceptions of local and indigenous people is a sense of everything's different now. I, I'm stealing a, a, a title from Nancy Turner there, um, but that everything's messed up. That what we're seeing is climate weirding. 
And um, so when there are these calendars of overlapping seasonal events in the natural world, ecological calendars that, um, that people in many cases have relied on to make decisions like when to plant a certain crop, um, those, those are disrupted. Um, indicators like uh, um, a certain plant species. In um, my early research, I was looking at rhododendrons. So certain rhododendron species that are, have been traditionally known to flower at the right time to plant buckwheat, I, I was told are now flowering at the right time to plant potatoes, which requires some sort of uh, you know, dynamism and attention on the part of this uh, traditional reckoning system to be able to adapt to the, to the climate driven change. Um, in the case of some plants that rely on pollinators to maintain their population, um, if the plants and the pollinators aren't coming at the same time, that can mean, um, you know, detrimental effects to the populations uh, or local extinctions. Um, and uh, in, in the other case I mentioned, for instance, with um, yaks or other grazers, yaks and cattle, we've been told by herders that, you know, some pretty subtle changes in the, the flora of the fodder species. Um, these are uh, grasses, but also um, uh, sedges as well. Those can have trickle down effects in the quality of the butter and the quality of the cheese that are important protein sources and important cultural items um, throughout the Himalayas, I think it's fair to say. Just the layers that of uh, Joseph Campbell, I mean, Joseph, Brinkman has talked about this in wild harvesting, you know, communities where they have their economic structures around harvesting plants at certain times, once that's changed, um, the whole economic livelihood gets disrupted. Jan, I wondered if you wanted to add to what you found. Yeah, I, I did want to add in a, here a little bit because we did a lot of, and you people are interested in medicinals, so so I did want to, we did a lot of research on, on Tibetan medicine and, and, and what's happening with medicinal plants. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, Tibetan doctors go up into the mountains for a month of the year in the summertime to collect medicinal plants. A lot of their med medicines come from high alpine areas. So our research, you know, our botanical research on, on the alpine then feeds into the ethnobotany about how Tibetans are, um, um, how climate change is affecting Tibetans. And it's in many more ways than just medicinals, but I'll, I'll mention those first and then, and then move on to the other, other factors. But um, so almost all the doctors that we interviewed and worked with um, noticed climate change. They, they may not call it climate change. A lot of our work, the Chinese government wasn't advertising climate change. So, you know, people were noticing changes, but didn't have, have a name for it as a, but, you know, when we went out and interviewed, we found that almost everybody recognized the fact that there was less snow, that there were, the temperatures were warmer, that there were more avalanches, that there were you know, there were any number of, of the glaciers were receding and, and uh, rain was coming at a different time and changing. So they saw these changes. Um, and, and the Tibetan doctors were really worried that their, the medicines that they depend on might be uh, affected and you disappeared. Oh, there you are. Um, um, but they have two real worries and probably the most immediate worry that they have is over harvesting because the Chinese government decided that the, uh, Tibet is one of the most economically impoverished parts of China, um, if you recognize them as that. Um, and so they decided, well, we'll sell medicinal plants and that will you know, bring in money to, uh, to Tibet. Unfortunately, there's, I, I won't go into all the details, but, but um, anyway, that when you open up a market like that on a, on a large scale, people, they would come in with trucks and just tell people, and they do it species by species, you know, collect all, you know, the snow lotus you can find. So the village would, you know, go out and cut down every snow lotus they could find and then bring it back and they would sell it for, 
little of nothing to the to the the buyers that would then haul them off to to the cities. Um, and that these are all alpine plants are slow growing and um, they're um, you know snow lotus in particular um, blooms once in its life. It'll grow for 10 or 20 years and finally bloom. And then just before it's going to set seed, along come these harvesters and lop off the top of the plant. And, um, and so it never, never reproduces. So the over harvesting is probably a much uh, greater immediate impact than climate change is. But nonetheless, climate change, is, as we have been noticing, is affecting um, medicinal plants. But it's a, climate change is also affecting Tibetans in many, many other ways that they are more aware of. Um, the crops that they're growing, they tend to be growing more warm, warm loving crops, which in turn tend, puts them into the market because then if you're not just growing these, you know, uh, a little bit of barley and buckwheat and that sort of thing, then all of a sudden you've, you've got fruits and vegetables and you sell to the market. And once you enter the market economy, then your whole, you know, livelihood strategies change tremendously. So we really found that um, throughout Nepal, Nepal and, and Bhutan, these high elevation communities were really what well, we, we, called a, a tipping point um, in, in climate change because they were changing so dramatically from one kind of traditional farming to you know, another, another sort of, of livelihood completely. There's so many things there. One, one I wanted to draw it and make sure it was clear. So there are kind of two separate supply chains for the botanical, right? There's the Tibetan doctors who would be going up to gather, and then there are those who are trucked in and that those are going as a more commodity. Is yes, it turns into, into a, a total commodity. And, you know, we did some, we did some very detailed population studies and found out that, you know, the small amounts that local doctors are harvesting for, for um, treating their, their local patients, the, the populations can be can sustain that, um, that kind of a harvest. But once they come into these mass harvesting, um, it, there's just no way that those populations maintain themselves. And this is something that doesn't um, always make its way into the Goria field work we do. But um, especially with our sites in Nepal, I want to recommend um, the, the work that our major collaborator there, Dr. Suresh Kamire, is doing, um, led by a, a series of graduate students where he's been looking at these plants that we encounter in the Gloria Plot and that we know to be affected by climate change, um, but which are also under this, this intense harvest pressure and trying to actually do the work and the quantification to say for this particular species and its species biology, um, how much harvest is acceptable? Um, are there levels of harvest that might actually increase its yield? Um, and what are the levels of harvest that are inevitably going to drive it towards local extirpation? And another, another aspect that we studied that we found was very interesting is how Tibet, Tibetan cosmology was changing with climate change. You know, you, you don't think about um, so many things change. I mean, their traditional clothing changes because they, you know, used to wear these heavy yak robes and so on. And they can't, it's hot now, you know, they can't wear those anymore. And, and they used to eat very fatty meats and, and you know, high and, and everybody's having heart problems now because they don't, you know, they're not burning it off in the cold the way they used to. And uh, so, so many things change, but also their religion is, is changing. And they're, they're, you know, frantically trying to deal with these aspects of climate change. And they don't know, and they it often, you know, they don't, it, it, it breaks your heart because they're blaming themselves, you know, for, for climate change. And it's like, no, no, it's not your fault. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they, 
they look at it in terms of, of Buddhism, they look at it in terms of kind of shamanism, and then, you know, the little bit of science that they know, they are also, we and they try to weave all these ideas together, but, uh, but it's really, and they, and they'll, they're praying to almost any, you know, God they can, that they can think of, and, uh, and you, you just, see these ceremonies going on where these farmers are just praying for rain or praying for less rain or you know being there at the avalanches that are falling and the, and the mountains themselves are are sacred and so they see the the glaciers and the snow melting off the mountains and they think their gods are are disappearing that they're you know leaving earth and uh, so it's, um, it's the effects of climate change are so drastic, you know, from down from the individual plant level, you know, to, you know, people's whole view of, of the universe. I wonder how, so how is that to do research, which can be on one level, you know, you're doing plant species meter, you know, counting plants, and it's around such, huge, you know, ethical well, that's, issues. That's, that's why we do the ethnobotany. So we don't only do the, the plant, you know, the minute plant research, but we're also doing, you know, we're interviewing people. We're, you know, we do all these different kinds of mapping exercises and, uh, and we study people's farming. And so we, you know, it's just not one aspect that we look at, but we try to look at as and we study their religion, you know, so we're, we're looking at as many things as we can. And, and I will say, I, mean, I think that one of the ways that, that we can powerfully have an effect on this beyond just being scientists is by affecting policy. And, um, you know, Jan has worked for um, years and years to try to get these sorts of understandings and uh, the colleagues we work with and some of the local people we work with into international policy documents, into international policy meetings, so that they can have a, a voice at the table and, um, and that these big frameworks that affect how we look at climate change can, can actually you know, be informed by some of this work. And, and I also wonder then, maybe now is a time when you could talk some about the other, so when you, as a scientist working in communities where their lives are being changed so much, what else can, I mean, I always feel this urgency of like, I need to do something to help. <laughs> um, and I wondered how, how you. Well, we have, I mean, we have had sort of develop, you know, small scale development project kind of things where, you know, one community we built a school and one community we built a health center. And, you know, we, we have all these different uh, different local activist projects that we do, um, but we are, you know, we are academics, so we're kind of publisher parish types. But and and development is not our major uh, our major role. But we certainly, you know, you can't help but do that along the way because you're, you know, you're living with these people and you and you know how they're they're being affected. So you know, we bought. We bought a water pump for you know one village. We bought and so different, depending on what their needs were. Agroforestry projects. They wanted to introduce, you know, fruit trees. All of a sudden, can grow in in Nepal at a much higher elevation than ever they ever grew before. And so they wanted uh, fruit trees and so on. So you know, we try to we try to do something to share. You know, so we're not there just taking out information, but also sharing things. And I think that, that sort of um, kind of communication about the the goals has also been been really important to us, and it's been important to um, to build o over time. You know, I had the wonderful advantage of um, stepping into field sites that uh, um, Jan and and her uh, national level local colleagues had already established and had been to for, um, uh, for years and had some sort of sense with the local people that they would continue to keep working there. 
And, um, and I think then one can build a sort of communication and recognize that not all of your goals are always going to be shared. You know, we do, we do care about collecting these sort of minute level, um, uh, fine, sometimes esoteric from certain contexts, details about plant life. Um, uh, and, but, but sometimes we can find shared goals. Um, so, uh, you know, what, one thing I found, um, in when I was working on rhododendron was when I asked people about rhododendron uses, the first thing everyone would say to me is that's a useless plant. You know, it's not an important medicinal species. It's not an important crop species. Uh, it's just a pretty flower. Um, but then in the conversation, they'd go on to talk for an hour about all the ways rhododendron in fact is used. Um, so it was something that, that was, uh, you know, something that was more relevant to me as, as a visiting botanist than, than to the local people, in fact. But it was something where hopefully, um, you know, we can use it to tell a climate change story and have, have an impact, um, you know, at, at some level, at least communication level on, on climate change policy again, which I, I think is the most important way that we can all actually affect the underlying problem here. You know, following that, there's a, a lot of good questions that I want to turn to in a second, but I'm curious how this work has changed each of you, sort of, and it could be, that can be answered any way, but has it, I mean, I, yeah, you can answer it however you want. Um, oh, it's, this is, I, I, I can't even begin to say how many, and it's not only the work itself, but the students I've been working with, every student brings their own, their own strengths and in, into these projects and their own ideas. And so one of my students was, was desperately interested in the in uh, sacred sites. And so we, we ended up uh, publishing three papers on sacred, four papers on sacred sites and, and, and biodiversity and so on. And never in my life would have I ever, you know, done any, any research like that. But, um, um, and, and just, Ah, the profound ways that the Tibetans will think about their, their, the surrounding world and the world and how world and religion and everything are just part and parcel of the same thing. And um, the, you could, you know, you can feel how the, how, how, how deep these people relate to to different topics and um, and it's 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 fascinating and how clever they are <laughs> you know they're just unbelievably clever we'd get into trouble uh, on one thing or another and we'd come up with an answer or you know we'd have to push through an unbelievable conditions and push through we did you know so um, yeah the people taught me a tremendous amount. I think by, by nature, I'm, I'm someone who sometimes will be nervous to ask for help. Um, I want to try to, you know, push something as far as I can myself before I go bothering someone with a request for help. And international field work in any context uh, sure teaches one how wrong that attitude is very quickly. Um, the, the extent to which um, we rely on these strong collaborations with uh, local scientists um, in each of these countries, um, uh, the extent to which we rely on on their students and um, and the local people around these field sites is just really obvious. So um, I it, it, every year and every time we go out in the field or have to ask them a question um, over over email or over the phone when it's possible, that becomes more and more clear to me. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, there are a lot of questions about the harvesting of traditional herbs, and so I wanted to have time for that. Um, there are these questions around who owns the land where the herbs are being harvested, and then kind of connected, and, and that probably is different for the Tibetan doctors as well as in the Chinese. Um, but has there been resistance to the increased commercial collection and sale of traditional herbs? In China, which includes Tibet, 
um, technically, um, no one owns land. There is the government owns the land. So, but nonetheless, there are, you know, villages <laughs> um, lay claim to certain lands and some very famous research, I think, by uh, Yi on, on uh, you know, how people are killed when they step over the line and, and harvest from, from someone else's village, you know, and there's, since there, these products are worth so much money, you know, that it, it gets to be a major, you know, harvest of matsutake mushrooms puts all the kids through school, you know, that the, it supports a village, you know, they don't have a lot of cash economy, but uh, matsutake mushrooms really make it a cash economy uh, for, for otherwise these kids couldn't go to school. So um, it can be extremely important and can be deadly. You know, so, uh, uh, but land tenure is weird, yeah, in China. What was, was there more to that question? Or um, so um, that's what talking mushroom, is that, it, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Is that separate then from cordyceps? Yes, um, Matsutake, Matsutake makes more money than cordyceps. Cordyceps makes money as well as um, cordyceps is the, um, every, what everybody's been hearing about that. But um, it's, no, Matsutake is amazing. Um, particularly, they harvest it during the day and then they take the mushrooms and they individually wrap them in rhododendron leaves and they take them down to the roadheads and at night um, these uh, four by four uh, jeeps will come careening across these roads that are just hair raising you know in the daytime and here they are traveling at night and they stop at one roadhead after another road and they buy matsutake mushrooms from everybody and by the morning they're back in the closest airport and the, those mushrooms fly off to Japan, and they're on the on the market by um, by that's next within 24 hours. They're on the fresh market in in Japan for you know hundreds of times what they're they're the purchase price in the villages, but they're it's extremely important for for the villagers, and it just happens at one time of year. And um, the whole village goes out and that's what they do is they harvest matsutake mushrooms. They're fantastic mushrooms. They taste delicious. <laughs> you, know, they're, um, you know, in this country, our, uh, mushrooms that we think are great here are considered trash mushrooms in, in China. You know, they're just, <laughs> so they have a much uh, bigger appreciation of mushrooms than we do, as do the and, Japanese, why they sell so many. And so we've mentioned two uh, sort of fungal related species, Matsutake mushrooms and uh, um, cordyceps or Ophiocordyceps. And um, those are really uh, very important cash crops, cordyceps ac across the entire Himalaya and the permafrost area. Um, there are also, of course, plant species that are important cash, cash crops. Uh, uh, Nardisacus jetamanthi is is one in Nepal that's um, quite valuable. But um, but yeah, and I think it, in general, what Jen was saying for China goes for our, our other sites to some extent as well. Is that what we often see is that most of the areas we work in in the high high mountains are subject to some sort of broader national control, you know, be it a national park or a national conservation area or a protected area, no matter what it's exactly called. Um, but almost all of them have a, you know, strong de facto sense of ownership by the, the local communities, the local, you know, villages, I guess, in, in most cases. In fact, my dissertation research was looking at the traditional systems of common property resource management in Eastern Nepal. Um, I wanted to follow up. So the other, another part of that question was whether there's been any movement around overharvesting, any um, around Tibetan organization or are the Chinese doing anything? Um, but I wanted to add 
into the Chatamansi a few weeks ago as one of these webinars, we spoke with um, someone from UNSAB who was talking about the efforts to get Fair Wild certified Jatamansi coming from Nepal. Um, and that project's just in the early stages. Um, but I wondered if you know of other, you know, what Tibetan communities are doing or any awareness around addressing that over harvesting. I don't know the that the Chinese government has owned up to the problems with over harvesting. You know, we published one paper that showed that over a hundred years, snow lotus have shrunk in size by almost a half um, because they get more money for larger snow lotus. You know, so it's got not only is the plant disappearing, but the the morphology of the plant is changing so drastically. Um, and we tried to get it on the endangered species list in China and never, never could. Um, but I may be out of date. I haven't worked in China for the last five years. So, but I mean, I keep hearing about, you know, the same thing going on in, in um, Mongolia and so on that they're just harvesting like crazy. So I don't think that's become an issue that I've heard of. And I guess you know, these are globally important resources and they are, you know, they are important around the world and they have been important in, in market economies from the Himalayas for a, for a long time too. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm not an economist, but from everything I've seen, it, it's really hard to overstate the importance of the, the Chinese market in as, as driving these big swings in cost and these big swings in, um, in demand and extraction. Um, that a lot of the, you know, it, it may be different in some species versus others, but in almost every species I read about, most of the demand is, is in coming from mainland China. Yeah, we could continue talking about that for a while. Um, I, I wanted to, there's a slightly different tack of a question by Fabian Schultz, which gets to the work that you're the Brown Center I think is doing, but I, he, he or she, sorry, writes, I'm interested in whether you transfer results of your published studies back to the local communities. If so, how do you transfer results back? What are the most effective methods? Or just how you work with the local, either the village or the national government communities to the exchange of knowledge. And yeah, different projects we've done differently. Um, we, um, we have personally gone back because you know, just writing it up doesn't really work very well, but we've gone back to the communities and, and talked about it. You know, we, we have community meetings and we discuss what we found. And, and I always like it when I get feedback from them. Do you, are we interpreting this right? You know, what do you think about this? And, and so on, because they'll, they'll have much better insights often than, than I do because they're living there. Um, but yeah, we, we try to, you know, we've done posters and things like that, that, but I'm never, I'm never terribly convinced by that sort of thing. And el yeah, elsewhere in the world, we've, you know, I've done a lot, I've tried a lot of different ways, but um, since, since we're working so closely with the local people, I think just talking to them really helps as much as anything. Uh, but we do have students, um, uh, particularly in Nepal, well, China too, we had lots of students. And so that, um, that's great feedback, you know, to that give them an opportunity for education and for, and for, you know, entering into the research. Um, and then, and then when they go back, then it's, they have a lot more impact than we ever could. Yeah, and I think one of the answers that we often see in projects like this is sort of locally, you know, locally facing publications, kind of um, uh, image forward books that can um, be distributed locally. And we, we have done that in, in some cases, uh, again, for, for some other projects. Um, but Jan's right that it just, it really depends on the, on the target communities. Um, uh, some places that we work in, um, 
uh, in Yunnan, um, our, uh, a lot of our target audience has cell phones and constant web access and can really benefit like something like one pilot project we did with um, uh, doing a small um, talking dictionary of uh, ethnobotanically important plants where people could see this plant species and hear the name spoken by a native speaker um, when that specialized terminology or indeed the language itself might be something they don't have a lot of access to. Um, so that was something where um, people had that technological capacity already, but they didn't necessarily have the cultural access and we could do something that was relevant in that way. Um, so I think, but, it, but of course that would be, you know, totally inappropriate in a different community. Um, we have also had issues where um, uh, local communities ask actually for previous generations of scholarship to, to be repatriated or, and that can be as simple as, as sending them PDFs, which they're locked out of because the uh, academic system is really geared towards big uh, Western institutions that have library subscriptions that they can pay for. Um, or in some cases, it can be um, translating and putting into print form, you know, previous generations of scholarship. And, and it's always also great. And one benefit of this, it's not only ethically important and it not only shows reciprocity, but it also elicits meta commentary, right? That, um, you know, Jan's done a lot of work with old, old pictures that were sort of taken of a local place and then taken out of their context and put in archives and books in, in the West. And to talk to someone in the village now about what this picture of their village um, shows in terms of the change over the last hundred years can be really powerful. Or to, um, as my, uh, um, undergrad advisor David Harrison does, you know, to videotape someone talking about um, the use of a certain plant in their native language, and then show them the video and and uh, elicit this meta commentary of, you know, what are their thoughts about this? What might they want to correct, or what what add to it or change about it? Um, you know, it it just adds to the amount of data and understanding that then we have. Yeah, the, that research with the with the old photographs was just, it was such a riot to do because we would just get crowds of, of old people coming around. You know, these pictures are from 100 years ago. And um, they could they could recognize, you know, oh, look at this, you know, and look at how different this is and everything. And then we'd just get groups and groups of people. And we just, you know, we couldn't write fast enough. We would get so much information on change, which is what we were interested in. And it was great. And the other thing that we did was hand out cameras, you know, little pocket cameras and things and let people, okay, you show me what you think is, you know, in, what changes are important. And, uh, and, you know, again, just absolutely wonderful photographs of, that people, and then you, you know, you bring these photographs back to them and they are just so pleased, you know, they are just so happy to have, we got this one photograph of this man. I don't know how close he was to this bear. You know, it was just like, it was, it looked like it was wrapped around the camera. He's got, you know, and these are little, little pocket cameras. So it's not like you have a telephone lens. On, you know? so, and he was a hero in the village for having come up with this photo. But, um, but anyway, yeah, when you interact very closely with the village, the villagers and so on, you, Oh, it's just, or even if they just draw maps, you know, they just, they, they pour themselves into it. Got great photographs of these people all bending over the, the local snooker table, you know, drawing these maps and everything. And it's just, they're really super into it. You know, they just really concentrate hard. So any interaction that you've got with with people. And then, of course, if you build them a school, they'll, they'll do anything for you because you, their kids get to go to school. Well, it's one, one advantage, you know, long term projects like the Gloria project, where you come back again and again to monitor a long term change, are not always super amenable to grant deadlines, but they are really amenable to building up a long term re relationship with a community and bringing back information and, you know, demonstrating that you have an investment in that community. 
There's, yeah, thank you. There, um, we're coming to the end of the hour, but there's one question. I mean, there's a lot of questions that are good questions here that we don't have time to answer, but there's one that kind of flows from what you've both been talking about. So I wanna include it if we can have one or two more minutes. Um, this is, what is your opinion about the loss of indigenous knowledge about Materia Medica in the Himalayas within the last century? Is handing down medicinal knowledge still strong in the communities or are the youth aiming for a more modern Western way of life? Um, uh, yeah. Well, I can answer that in, a, in, a, in a, so many ways. Everybody's interested in a Western, Western medicine. When I, you know, one of the things that you do is you ask, you know, well, what would you like me to do? And, you know, you have to be careful. I went to the Amazon and they wanted, they wanted me to teach them how to grow apples. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. Um, but the, the Tibetan doctors wanted me to get a, a, a Western doctor to come up and teach them Western medicine because they are interested in integrating. You know, they're not, they don't believe in one system and one system only sort of. Um, uh, but I didn't, I didn't have that, th that opportunity. But um, uh, on the other hand, they're very interested in continuing their, I mean, the Tibetans are just desperate to, you know, for cultural continuity. So they're very interested in keeping their, their traditional medicine going. And what's so important there, which is not immediately obvious, is that there's so many different kinds of Tibetan medicine. There's, I mean, on the one extreme, there's the stuff that's sold in markets that I was telling you about that they're harvesting so much of. And that's, that's a whole different medical tr tradition than is taught in the medical schools in Lhasa. But the, what's taught in the medical schools in Lhasa is a completely different tradition, again, from what is in, in every village. So there's local Tibetan medicine that is just worlds apart from, from you know, what the Chinese government recognizes as traditional, uh, uh, as Tibetan medicine. Um, but by and large in Tibet, people are very interested in maintaining their cultural identity. Um, in Nepal, we found different problems because a lot of people were moving out of the villages and, you know, they were very interested in commercial endeavors and so on. And so they, you know, they were up against this, um, they're very strong traders, you know, they're very, there's a lot of prestige and trading. And so they would leave the, the villages. Tourism is bringing in a, a, you know, a competing economy. So there's just, oh, there are a thousand problems and, and so on. But but by and large, Bhutan too has a very strong tradition in Bhutanese traditional medicine, and they they are trying very hard to maintain it. So it isn't it isn't disappearing. There are lots and lots of problems. So yeah, it's easy to find examples, you know, irrefutable irrefutable examples of of people losing traditional life ways, whether it's language or medicine or um, other parts of traditional life ways in response to socioeconomic pressures and global changes. Um, but at the same time, in quantitative ethnobotany, a lot of the studies that look at change across time carefully show that um, it, it's really hard to quantitatively show a, a a big loss of knowledge about medicinal plants over over time. So, uh, hopefully, there's both um, a sense of urgency, but but also hope there in terms of these cultural continuities. Well, and I also, I mean, hearing the stories and the examples you've given of you know using the phone and and coming back with photos, all those things to me, it seems that those keep show that people are interested and that in my experience, say in Eastern Nepal, the fact that I was interested helped younger people think, oh, maybe there's something here that's we should be interested in because we weren't really that interested before. 
And that was that was ex that was very important in China was to show the Chinese that you know they'd always kind of get upset and say, well, why aren't you studying Han knowledge? Han knowledge is so much better than anybody else. <laughs> And I was like, no, no, you're just not paying attention here. And, they, and they'd say, oh, we don't have to have translators. Everybody speaks Mandarin, you know, everybody speaks Mandarin. And, and they'd never been to a village, you know, Tibetan village where nobody spoke or very few people spoke um, Mandarin. And um, so they're just to show the Chinese academics and, and students and so on that, um, this is important knowledge. This is incredibly detailed knowledge, incredibly sophisticated knowledge that there, that there is. Um, I, I think often that's as much part of our role as anything. So I'm gonna need to wrap up. What, Robbie, I wondered if you have, can share a resource for looking at the cultural and the plant diversity and linguistic diversity that you mentioned. Or the, there was a question about that, but you know, it's a, a little outside the focus for today, but it's a fascinating area. There oh, sure. Um, I can just very quickly then say there's been lots of uh, interesting publications about this, um, but my favorite first stop would be uh, checking out um, the Living Tongues Institute, which is a, a nonprofit focusing on exactly this issue that um, was uh, founded by David Harrison, who I mentioned, and Gregory Anderson, um, and is doing really great work uh, along those lines. That's Living Tongues? Yeah, Living Tongues. Um, I also really, uh, I have a, a soft spot for um, a book that David was the author of um, called When Languages Die, which I, I was able to help out with, um, which sort of takes a deep look into each of the sort of types of environmental knowledge that get packaged into language and um, that can be lost if those languages are moved away from. Great. And I'll get the names and links for that and we'll share that in the follow-up email. Thank you both so much for taking the time and um, thank you everybody who's joined in on this webinar. Um, and we will share I'll share the questions with the speakers in case you feel like responding. There's quite a few, there's about 20. Um, and I just wanna share my screen again in closing, but before I do, thank you again for joining me and for your time. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And do you want us to stay or do you want us to leave? And, um, so you can stay if you'd like to read, 